How do you build a great relationship? Trust. You trust. I'll never forget. I lied to my mom when I was a teenager. <laughs> and she caught me in the lie. And she said, don't ever lie to me again. She goes, if you lie to me, I can't trust you. Oh, man. And if I can't trust you, we can't have a great relationship. That's the truth. I said the same thing to my kids when they lied to me. Because <laughs> they did. Good. They did. It's that good. Right. Because yeah, like, trust is the foundation upon which winning relationships are built. So mm-hmm. we got to build the trust. And it takes time to build the trust. You can spend years building trust, but it can be destroyed in a moment. I am joined by a best-selling author, what I would call one of the goats, Mr. John Gordon. Thanks for being on the show today. Thank you, my friend. Great to be with you. And it's just great to see you and also just to see where you've come all these years. Like we've known each other for so long. I call you Q. You do. I love it. My you mom know? calls me Q. You yeah, call me just Q. Like, I my love guy it. Q. So, yeah. so when you ask me to come, I'm like, of course. Well, man, thank you so much. I mean, you really became the energy bus man for a little bit. And then all of a sudden there's so many books that, right. you know, pick one, but you know, you've sold 5 million copies which is amazing. Right. Congratulations. I appreciate that. Yeah. So I was known as the energy bus guy. I think I still am. If you ask people like <laughs> John Gordon, they'll go energy bus. Yes. So energy they'll bus. say that, which is great. You want to be known for one book. So funny. My wife read the book mm-hmm. and she goes, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then my brother read it. He's like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's all right. Like they didn't grasp what it would be. And so I didn't know it would become anything. I wrote this thing that I thought would be successful rejected by over 30 publishers. I remember you telling me So the me that. manuscript you read and liked, 30 publishers said no. Finally, John Wally and Sons says yes. And it's a, it's a great lesson for people out there. You're going to get rejected. Mm-hmm. You're going to face adversity. You have to believe in it. Your vision, your purpose has to be greater than all the negativity and doubts along the way. And so for me, I just kept going, kept believing, kept hoping. Finally, John Wally and Sons agreed to publish the book. That was back in 2006, comes out in 2007. Mm -hmm. Q and Jack Del Rio, first people really to embrace (laughs) the book as Jack invites me to speak to the Jaguars. I speak to the team. Everyone reads the energy bus. So after that, everything took off. Oh, wow. Well, I'll tell you what, thank you. I, you know, it was an honor to get a chance to have that. And I remember when that took off and it's, I think it's fair to say today, you're considered the the collegiate and NFL expert when it comes to bringing teams to the same page and bringing pe- teams to success. Yep. I mean, you, you look at what you've done recently and who you've spoken with. I mean, I, I, it's hard for me to find someone you haven't spoken with, much right. less, you know, some people go, oh, they did this at Clemson and they did this at Alabama and they've gone to this Tennessee. I'm like, no, I, I can't find one he hasn't gone to. I appreciate you know? that. And, I, I love working with teams. I love working with sports teams. It's something I didn't expect. I didn't chase it. Mm-hmm. It came to me. That's amazing. I was recently with our friend, uh, you know, Ed Milet, and I'm with Ed, and we were talking about some of the teams I was working with, and then just recently I texted him, he's like, how do you know every single coach? <laughs> and what happens is they read my books. So they'll read my books, and then they reach out after reading the book. So it starts with the book. So I'm not chasing it. Mm-hmm. I'm putting out value. I'm helping people get better. Mm-hmm. I speak the language they understand. They want to help their players get better. Sure. So these books can help their players get better. So they're always looking for the edge. They're looking for the technique. They're looking for the strategy. They're looking for principles. And I speak their language in a way that is simple, something they can implement and act on. It wasn't my plan. It's just who I am and how I think. Right. And then I put the information out there. Then they call. And then we wind up having great conversations. After that, hey, can you help me here? Can you come speak to my team? Sean McVay reached out when he got the job with the Rams. Mm -hmm. He's 30 years old. We met at the Fairmont Hotel. Again, no one knows Sean McVay at the time. At this time, yeah. So we're meeting, and he's this young 30-year-old guy asking me a lot of questions, and we're talking about leadership. We're talking about culture. We're talking about teamwork. We're talking about the values that he wants to implement with his team. So I help him create his core values. We, not me, was one of those core values. I love that. He created a pyramid like John Wooden and put we, not me, in the middle of that pyramid. So now I see him implement these principles. I go and speak to the team that first year. Great team, great culture. Next year, go back, speak to the Mm -hmm. team. I see how his leadership is is impacting the team. Like, this guy's an incredible leader. He's a social genius, starting to have success. But I'm there all along. We're talking, we're connecting, we're, we're sharing. And so it starts with a book, then a meeting, five, six hours, trust. Then I'm coaching a coach Mm -hmm. who's coaching his team. And then all of a sudden you see him win a Super Bowl. Yeah. And it's just great to see that these principles play out and they work if you implement them. But you got to have a great leader. One of the things that I just took away from what you said there, and there's a lot to unpack, all of those, all of those teams, is it fair to say that the leaders have like a servant leadership? 
servant leadership yeah. mentality. Is there is that fair to say? I love that you said that. Eric Spolstra called me up, John, mm-hmm. come work with my coaches and I. Help us get better. Ah, love Help that. us be a stronger coaching team, a leadership team, so we can better serve our players. That's awesome. He knew that if they were more connected mm-hmm. and more committed to each other, they would better serve their players. A team that is not connected at the top will crumble at the bottom. Mm. So you must be connected at the top and committed at the top. And I think a lot of leaders and their teams don't don't realize that. So leadership teams need to be strong together and they should do some leadership work and teamwork at the highest level. They think, oh, our team needs it. No, you need it, leader. Good point. You and your team needs it. The Cowboys spoke to the Cowboys via Zoom. I was teaching them high state of mind mm-hmm. versus low state of mind. And they said, John, how do we help our players have more clarity? I said, you have more clarity. Uh, if you're a coach that has clarity, you're going to help your player have more clarity. But you need to focus on your clarity first, and you need to be a strong team first. So a lot of my work is around developing strong leaders and teams mm-hmm. and then helping them to better lead their teams. But also then speaking to the teams and then reinforcing the principles that those leaders want to share. Because you need an outside voice a lot of times. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I was listening to you talk about this and I hit pause and I was asked my wife, Aaron, I was like, listen to this for a second. And I love what you say about this. And, um, and, and you said a line, which was, you don't have to love everything about your spouse, but you got to love the things you love about your spouse. I thought that was wonderful. I mean, and, and, and then you said it about your job. Then you said yeah. about the sales force. Can you take a minute to, to explain to the audience yeah. the, high, the high and the lows here? Well, you have to understand that fear is what separates you. Fear divides mm-hmm. you, it weakens you, and it brings you to a lower state of mind where you have all these negative thoughts and worries. I believe And it. you focus on the negative. Mm-hmm. Love causes you to focus on, on oneness, on power, on unity, on strength, on joy, on peace, on purpose. And so when you are experiencing that that love, you experience a higher state of mind. When mm-hmm. you're experiencing a high state of mind, you also are able to radiate and emanate more love out into the world. And so talking about your wife, for example, and my wife, yeah. I'm not going to love everything about my wife. There are things that I don't like. She doesn't love to keep a clean house. I'm, I'm a need freak. I like right. things clean. I don't like a lot of clutter. She'll keep her stuff all over the place, but then she'll go on like a, this like rampage where she actually cleans it up in a positive way. <laughs> right. Like she gets all motivated and, and just all of a sudden this like, uh, I'm like, who is this now cleaning up everything? <laughs> but she'll leave it there for, for five or six days. Cause it doesn't bother her. Mm-hmm. She's able to get work done in the mess. I like a clutter-free environment to get work done. I'm trying to write a book. I walk into the kitchen, there's all this stuff. So do I like that? No, we fight about it sometimes. But what do I love about her? I don't want to focus on that all the time. Correct. Because that's who she is. Right. So a lot of times to not fight, I'll just deal with it. And I work on me. <laughs> right. Say, okay, this has no power over me right now. Don't even look at it. It's just your state of mind yourself. Right. So it's just clutter, but it has no impact on you. Some people will say it does, but it actually the outside environment doesn't really have an impact. You just need to be a higher state of mind. So, hey, how can I get better there? So what can I do? Mm-hmm. Well, I could focus more on loving her. I could focus love more it. on her positive attributes. She's spontaneous. She's not a need freak, but guess what? That's what I love about her because she's like having a dance party at midnight with the kids <laughs> on a weekend. Priceless moments. Dancing around to, to, to fun music. And right. these kids that we have will always remember their mom doing this and being that kind of spontaneous, loving, joyful, happy person. So They won't remember the stuff on the counter. No. They'll remember that moment no, forever. No, they'll remember that forever. So she creates experiences. And she's also someone who's always talking to the kids all the time. She's always there for me. She loves me. She supports me. She strengthens me. So there's so many great things. So Mm -hmm. am I going to focus on the bad or the good? I'm not going to love everything, but guess what? Focus on the things you do love. And guess what? The more you invest in that root and you nourish it, it produces great fruit. I love it. So nourish that root. Same thing in work. Mm -hmm. If you're in sales, are you going to love everything about sales? No. No. Do I love everything about being a speaker? I don't like flying. Commercial flying is a pain these days. I'm doing more private, thankfully, but I'm still flying a lot commercially and it's draining, right? So it really weakens me, drains me, it affects me. I can't stand the flying, but what do I love? Love making a difference. I love making an impact. I love going to a company and being able to do this work. So guess what? I've got to deal with that to do what I love. So 
don't focus on the planes. Mm -hmm. Focus on the impact you get to have. Focus on the purpose. Focus on the mission and make a difference every day. And I think that's the choice we have, knowing you're not going to love your job. You're not going to love everything about it. Right. But focus on what you can love about it. So if I'm hearing you correctly, if you're a salesperson, like your mind's got to be in the right place. Because if it's in the negative place of, of that low, you know, and you're not prepared for something great that's going to happen today, you're going to miss that opportunity. Right. You've got to elevate oh, your I love state that word. of mind. And so there's a way to do that. Like, how do we get to a high state of mind? Well, let me first back up. There's high state and low state. Mm -hmm. So often circumstances happen and we blame the circumstance. One day you're in traffic and it bothers you. The next day you're in the same traffic and it doesn't. So is true. it the traffic that is making you feel a certain way? No, because if it was the traffic you would respond the same way every single time. One day you're in a sales meeting and guess what? It doesn't go so well, but you're in a high mm -hmm. state. So you're like, let's go next meeting. I got this. But if you're in a low state and you have a bad meeting, you mm -hmm. start going, man, what's wrong with me? What's man, wrong with my company? What's wrong with my company? Am yeah. I not going to be successful? Like what's going on? Did I make a mistake? You start to question everything. You start to feel insecure. You start to feel uh -huh. doubt. So what characterizes a low state of mind? A lot of, a lot of thought, a lot of clutter, a lot of fear, worry, anxiety, and mm. doubt would characterize a high state of mind. A lot of clarity, a lot of focus, a lot of positive energy, not a lot of thoughts. You're actually not thinking a lot. You're just doing, you're doing being, it. and you're just in that zone, making it happen. Something happens, you rise above, I got this. Low state, same thing happens, and it brings you down. Mm -hmm. So it's not really the circumstance, it's your state of mind in the circumstance. But so often it looks like it's a circumstance that's it's affecting you, but it's not. It goes back to the coffee bean. We create from the inside out, yeah. not the outside in. So the power is always on the inside. So knowing that, the key is how can I get to that higher state of mind? Tune, T-U-N-E. So T is about trust and truth. So yeah. often doubt comes in, but let's trust and then let's speak truth on a daily basis. Words of encouragement to keep moving forward when the doubt comes in. And the truth okay. is you've been successful before and you can be successful again. The truth is you have everything you need inside of you to be great. The truth is you want to be great. Why? Because deep down there is greatness within you. Otherwise you wouldn't have this desire to be great. So true. We just have these voices that say you're not great. Mm -hmm. You're not going to make it. It's not going to happen. That's the battle of our mind that's going on every day. And that battle, those negative thoughts will sabotage you if you oh. let them. That's why trust and truth is essential. You unite with love. Love casts out fear. And so often we were talking about this earlier, how fear is often disguised as laziness. So actually you look lazy, but you're actually fearful. There's something that's holding you back from keeping keeping you from being who you're meant to be and mm. all that you're meant to be. So we have this wow. fear that often sets in and we have to focus on instead love because love casts out fear. So that's, that's the you unite mm. with love and you got to neutralize the negativity. I love that. This is key because the negativity is going to come in and negative thoughts are lies that will tell you things about yourself and your future that just aren't true. So don't believe the lies. Speak truth to the lies. Neutralize the negativity. Best advice I ever heard is from Dr. James Gills. He's the only person on the planet to complete six double Ironman triathlons. Wow. Double Ironman, which means you do an Ironman, a day later do another one. And the last time he did it, he was 59 years old. <laughs> and he was asked how he did it. He said this, I've learned to talk to myself instead of listen to myself. If I listen, I hear all the fear, yeah. the negativity the doubt, all the reasons why I can't finish this race. But if I talk to myself, I could feed myself with the words and the encouragement that I need to keep on moving forward. And so he would speak words of encouragement, words of life. He would memorize and recite scripture. That's what mm. fueled him. Yeah. That's what encouraged him. So he did that. Whatever words encourage you, pick those words, neutralize the negativity. Gandhi said, I will not let anyone walk through my mind with their dirty feet <laughs> and neither should you. So don't let other people don't let their negativity affect you. Be more positive than the negativity that you face. And also internally, when those negative thoughts come in, don't allow those negative thoughts to bring you down, neutralize them. And then the last one is E, elevate your thinking. There it is. Elevate your thinking. That's positivity. Mm -hmm. That's gratitude. That's appreciation. When you appreciate, yes. you elevate. The research shows you can't be stressed and thankful at the same time. And so I'm convinced the more you feed yourself with optimism, with belief, with positivity, the more resilient you become, the stronger you become, the more you're able to take on the challenges that you face. So I always say being positive is not gonna guarantee you'll succeed, but being negative 
will guarantee that you won't. The thing I took away from what you said there in the word tune, it's all built on the foundation of trust mm. and truth. And, you know, if you can't have trust in a relationship, whether it's at home, whether it's at work, then you're never going to grow. I mean, you can't get to the rest of the word yeah. tune. You know, you can't get to that elevated state if you can't have trust and truth with yourself, with your significant other, and with your work. You don't have that, you know, and that they always say the truth will set you free, yeah. right? Oh, I say that all the time, and you just nailed it. I mean, trust is everything. How do you build a great relationship? Trust. Do trust. I'll never forget. I lied to my mom when I was a teenager, <laughs> and she caught me in the lie. And she said, don't ever lie to me again. She goes... If you lie to me, I can't trust you. Oh, man. And if I can't trust you, we can't have a great relationship. That's the truth. I said the same thing to my kids when they lied to me. Because <laughs> <laughs> they that did. Good. They did. It's that good. Right. Because yeah, like, trust is the foundation upon which winning relationships are built. So mm -hmm. we got to build the trust. And it takes time to build the trust. You can spend years building trust, but it could be destroyed in a moment. Yeah. Like, think of it like a tree, right? It takes mm -hmm. years for that tree to grow, but it could be chopped down in a moment in a lack of integrity, a lack of trust. So you want to have great relationships? Be someone who is trustworthy and also someone who trusts others. But when you've been betrayed, mm -hmm. when you have trauma of your past, when you have things that happen to you where you really, people you did trust had let you down, a lot of times this happens in relationships. Yep. You love someone, they betray your trust. It becomes hard to trust. And I tell people, don't let man's faults keep you from the trust that you're meant to have to create the life that you're meant to live. I love that. So don't let them affect you. You got to trust in the creator of the universe, I believe. Mm -hmm. And you have that ultimate trust. God did not let you down. People let you down. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and, and knowing that you're such a man of faith, I can share this story with you and I, I think you'll appreciate it. Yeah. So at the crowning of Mary, they did when my daughter went through this, they're young. They're I think second, third grade at this point. I'll never forget. Uh, the father says this to the, to the kids in the mass. And he says, the priest says, you know, at this young age, I want to share something with you guys. Cause I think that it's going to help you throughout life. He said, you know, right now you have these thoughts and I want you to think about thoughts. Sometimes it might be negative towards school. It might be negative towards your brother, your right, sister, right. or your parents. He goes, but these thoughts, once they start manifesting, they start to just accidentally slip out your mouth. And he goes, because you've thought about it for so long, mm -hmm. it just slips out of your mouth. And then once you start saying things, you start acting on the things that you're saying. Wow, that's good. And he said, and when your actions start doing what you're thinking and what you're saying, it defines your character, who so, you are. Wow. And I'm, I'm sitting in there just blown away. Then I'm thinking, these are second to third graders. That's real heavy. <laughs> but boy, it's a great message. And I, I just, it immediately came to me when you were saying that, you know, because what goes through our head, you know, it becomes who we are. Yep. And the thoughts that come in, you have to understand, they're not coming from you. Uh, they're not initially. Right. How do I know this? Who would ever choose to have a negative thought? Right. We always say, do your negative thoughts come from you? And people say, yeah, they're in my head. <laughs> but who would ever choose to have a negative thought? This blows their mind. They're like, wait a second. I do this with professional athletes all the time, college athletes. Ask them this question. They start shaking their head like, uh, I wouldn't choose those negative thoughts. Exactly. Right. So what happens is the thought comes in so quick. It comes in from consciousness, comes in from a spiritual place. No one has ever found a thought inside of a brain. I've asked neuroscientists. So what happens is the thought comes in. You believe the thought because you think it's from you. Mm -hmm. Then you reinforce it. Uh, then you speak it out loud. Now it becomes a part of you. It becomes part of your pattern. It starts to become part of your soul and your mind. Your mind and soul are, are one and the same. It's like the spiritual energy field part of you. Mm -hmm. And then you have this brain, which is the hardware. It's where activation happens. And so what happens so often now is this software now is being programmed, though in a negative way, yeah. that starts to actually program the brain and starts to have these thoughts come forth towards the brain and in the brain. And what happens is it actually, we're going to find, I guarantee 20 years from now, I'm asking scientists to do research on this, find a way to do it. It will affect the energetic structure of your brain, the thoughts you're thinking. Wow. Negative thoughts or positive thoughts. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes complete sense. And so once you understand what I think becomes who I am and the reality of that, you realize, wow, these negative thoughts are trying to bring me down, mm -hmm. keep me from my destiny, yep. keep me from who I'm meant to be. Keep me from being my best self. Keep me from taking action. What do they do? They make me want to give up. They discourage me. They create doubt. They create distractions. They create division. The Greek root word of anxious also means divided. Uh, when I'm anxious, I feel okay. divided. I feel separate. 
Don't you feel that way when you're anxious? Oh, all the time. I don't feel connected. I don't feel one. I don't right. feel powerful. Another thing I heard there was that when you're when you're one, you're you're positive. Your mindset's in the right place. People are attracted to that. Versus when you're you're not one, right? You're separated. You're lonely, and you're lonely because people aren't attracted to that. You walked in this building today, and it was like, Phew. wow. People wanted to talk to you. They wanted to meet you. And I mean, you have this this powerness about energy that just people want to be attracted to. And I think that's how people that are positive are. And you notice that you gravitate towards them. And I think that's another reason why people are separated when they're fearful and when they let negativity seep in. Well, it starts with the thought first. So when you are loving, when you are kind, what happens is you are feeling one and connected. Mm -hmm. And because of that oneness, you're now emanating that oneness and people are attracted to that because yes. they want to be connected to that. So they move towards you. When you are feeling separate, you're feeling disconnected, you're feeling isolated, the very thing you need is to be connected and yet you're actually pushing people away. Look at all mental health issues. Mm -hmm. They all move from oneness to separateness. Mm. You can literally move, you know, look at every single person who's struggling with depression, bipolar, you name it, they all feel separate. Yeah. They feel isolated, they feel disconnected. Why? Because they feel separate from others. It's not that, they are separate. They're pushing people away because they feel separate. So they're manifesting in their life what they already feel because they feel separate at the core of their being. Mm -hmm. We've got to bring those people back into the fold. Going back to ego, it stands for edging God out. Yeah, I love and your that. ego disconnects you from God and mm -hmm. also disconnects you from others. Why? Because you're focusing on self. You're not focusing on others. When you're loving others, you're focusing on them. You want to give to them. Pavarotti said, everybody wants the audience to love them, but I love the audience. Uh, so here he is loving the audience with his performance. And what happens? They love him back. That's so sincere. The person with a big ego is focusing on themselves. So they're not getting a lot of love back because they're not giving that love. So what happens is with the ego is you feel separate. So you feel powerless. Mm -hmm. So now you need a sense of power. So that gives rise to the ego because it needs to feel some sort of control and power. And as a result of that, now you want control, you want power, but it's false power. It's uh, limited power because it's connected to self, not something greater. Right. Oneness is connected to something greater, a powerful force, the most powerful force in the universe, the creator of the universe and others. And you feel connected to everybody and everything with the ego. You now feel separate and you don't feel connected. And so you're focusing on this limited power and that's why it doesn't last. I made a choice years ago, as you know, because I was so negative, so miserable. My wife almost left me. I was that guy who was choosing the negative and allowing the negativity to sabotage me. Yeah. I think that's real important. If I didn't win the battle of my mind and understand this and do the work to become more positive, where every day I'm practicing gratitude. Every day I'm saying prayers. Every day I'm feeding my, my mm -hmm. mind with positivity. Every day I'm tuning into that positive frequency on a daily basis. If I don't do that, I'm not the person I am now. Yeah. So years of doing that over time, of trusting and believing and being optimistic and changing my mindset and rewiring myself from negative to positive changed the course of my life. And now people look at me and go, oh, you're just someone who attracts all right. these people to you. No, I made that choice on a daily basis to be that person, right. to do this work, to make this impact, to be someone who's going to focus on others, not myself. Because I realized the reason why I was so miserable and negative was because I was focusing on myself. Mm. That's why I was so miserable. I had a big ego. I was so f fearful of failure. I was so focused on not being and living up to this potential that I thought that I had, mm -hmm. and I actually was putting too much pressure, expectations on myself, and I was crumbling. And this is what so many people do, especially young people. Expectations, they have pressure, they have these goals they wanna achieve, they wanna be CEO right now. They right see now. on social yep. media, all these people having success, multi-million dollar companies, they think, why aren't I doing that? What's wrong with me? And so they start yes. to feel down, and they allow those negative thoughts to then bring them down this downward spiral, and they never become, ultimately, this person that they can truly be because now they're focusing on the negative. Right. So your job every day, if you're listening to this, focus on the positive, tune into the positive, believe, be optimistic, be hopeful, return back to oneness if you're feeling separate. 
right? Focus on love immediately. The minute I feel fear, I'm going to focus on love. You said something about social media, and I want to kind of touch on that just briefly here, is that there's this emptiness inside of people that it's, ne- it's never about social media. It was about the emptiness is yeah. what you were saying. We blame social media as why people are struggling right now, why uh, mental health is, is such an issue. And everyone's looking at social media as the cause, why teenagers are dealing with so much anxiety. It's not social media. That's the vehicle. Mm-hmm. The real issue is separateness. There's a gap between this connection, this oneness that you're meant to have and the feeling of separateness. And in that gap, you're trying to fill the gap. So when you watch social media and you're on social media, you're trying to fill the gap with trying to feel good, but it actually doesn't make you feel good. It makes you actually feel worse because what's happening is now you're comparing. And when you compare, you despair. Uh, And so what happens is you are looking outside instead of inside going back to, to the coffee bean. I'm looking at someone else's success. I'm looking at their life. I'm looking at what they're doing, what they're creating. And now I feel like a failure. Now I feel like I'm not living up to the success of others. Mm -hmm. They don't have a better life than you. They just have a better editor than, than you. Right. You are meant to focus on you, your path. You're meant to focus on your purpose, who you're meant to be. You focus on being better every single day. That's the key. Yes. Get better every day. Don't look at where you're going all the time. Have a vision, but each day, look at how you're getting better and what you're doing to be your best every day. And the more you do that, you're going to find happiness within you doing that and making progress. But if I'm always comparing myself every single day, that makes me feel more and more separate. Oh, yeah. And the more I feel separate and disconnected, because mm-hmm. I don't feel one with that person because I think they're better than me. Right. If I look at someone who's having success and I feel one with them, I'm actually celebrating their success. There it is. When I'm actually feeling separate from that person, I'm now jealous. I'm now envious. I feel more and more disconnected, more and more separate. So kids, pressure of doing well on tests, pressure of getting to a good college, pressure to have a great job. Yes. More now than ever, parents are talking about like, how's your kid doing? Oh, my kid right. doing great. Well, what about your kid? <laughs> you know, it's like my, my daughter worked at a restaurant for a year and a half working as a hostess and I could have been more proud. Yes. Yeah, you know, I didn't care that she had this right. great job. Other people like my daughter's she making drive. My daughter's making one hundred, two hundred thousand dollars a year. She's doing. I don't care. My daughter is doing what she's meant to do, and she'll find a way and find her path. Because I bartended right after college, and I found my way, and it was the great best example. thing she ever did. She learned service. She learned customer service. But the point was, she was creating her life. Mm-hmm. She wasn't comparing herself to someone else. Oh, that's such a and good point. And society, we're doing that more and more, which is leading to more and more depression and destruction. But it's not the social media. It's the comparison. And it's the vehicle that's creating the comparison. See, in the past, you actually drove home and you saw your neighbor's new car. <laughs> and you got jealous because your neighbor had a new yeah. car or what they were doing with their house. Yeah. What are they doing? Or the new job they got. And yeah. you're jealous because your yeah. neighbor had that. So it's the same thing. It hasn't changed. What it is now is it's just in your face every, every single day on social media. So if you can't handle it, get off it. But the key is the true test is can I look at this and know it has no power over me? Oh man, I love that. And I, you know, if you don't listen to anything on this podcast, just go straight to what we just talked yeah. about right there. If you're a parent, this is for you. Oh. Share this with your kids. And and I'm really glad we went down that rabbit hole because I wanted that I wanted that clip for my kids to hear. Yeah. Can we can we finish on the, the title of this podcast? Absolutely. What, Absolutely. Is, what is the title of the podcast? The title of the podcast is What's Your One More? Sean, what's your one more? I, I think everyone should answer that question at the end of this podcast. I love, I, it. I love that. What is your one what more? What is your one that more? That really define. Because when you told me the name of this podcast, it got me thinking, like one more. What do I wish I had one more of? And you know what, it's, you know what it is? What's that? I wish I had one more walk with my mom. Mm. We would walk together and that was our thing. We would always take these walks together. And the last time I saw her live, we took a walk together. Wow. And we talked about life. We talked about just everything. I told her about my faith because I had, was just coming to faith during that time. My mom was Jewish. And I told her that I'm, I'm going to start following Jesus. <laughs> and she's like, <laughs> in the past, she was like, what? <laughs> like, Jesus, he was a prophet. What are you talking about? She goes, Jesus was Jewish. I go, I know he was Jewish, but, but he was awesome. He was awesome. Of course he's Jewish and he's awesome. And then, um, so we were talking about that. And, and she said, well, who am I to say he wasn't who he said he was? Mm. It was on one of our last conversations. And she never said that before. And that's what she said. And on this walk, she goes back into the, to her place and she made me a sandwich for my drive home. It was a five hour drive home. My mom thought I would starve to death if I didn't have a sandwich <laughs> for this five hour drive home. Cause she was a Jewish mom. Sure. I was going from South Florida back here to Jacksonville. Okay. And on this drive home, I ate the sandwich, but I didn't think much about it at the time. 
And now I think about that sandwich all the time because that was the last time I saw her fully alive. Wow. She had cancer, but wouldn't tell us how bad it was. And then it was bad, but think about it. She's battling cancer, and yet her biggest priority is to make me that sandwich. Wow. And I think about that all the time. So I wish I had one more walk with her. So how does that influence my life? What's your one more? To make a difference and impact people. So what my one more is, every day I want one more person I can impact. One more person that I can hopefully speak life into. One more that I can teach the one truth to. I've been on calls every single day talking to different people, not charging for it, but just talking to athletes, mm -hmm. friends, sons, people who are struggling, a lacrosse player who plays at Princeton and talking to her because I know her dad who was struggling and fearful and teaching her this and they are turning it around literally in that conversation. Wow. Shifting immediately. So I know this is so powerful. So I just want one more opportunity to impact one more person because my mission when I started this, the minute I started speaking and writing years ago when we met, I said my goal is to inspire and impact as many people as possible one person at a time. That's why I think the name of this podcast is so great. One person at a time, one more. With my kids, I want one more conversation to impact them, one more time to be with Love them that. and to, to touch them and impact mm -hmm. them because impact the people who will be crying at your funeral. That's who matters most. I think you should impact everyone, but, sure. but especially those. If you're not impacting the people who will be crying at your funeral, then something is wrong. If you're spending time on everyone else, but not the people who will be at your funeral and crying at your funeral, that says a lot of, of, of who you need to spend time with. Wow. So I need to make them my greatest priority. I love that. And then from there, like that's the core. Mm -hmm. And from that core of my family and investing in them, because I used to not. You know, years ago, I was so busy speaking to everyone else and not taking the time for my family. Now it's, okay, make time for my family. Put them first. One more conversation with them. One more time to really speak life into them, to love them, to, to, to encourage them, to help them become who they're meant to be. And then from there, go out and do that with the world. That's how I see it. One more impact, one more person, one more day, one more life. Let's go do it. I love it. Let's do it. John, thanks for being on the show. Where can our guests and audience find more about you? They can go to johngordon.com, J-O-N Gordon.com or Twitter, Instagram at J-O-N Gordon 11 at J-O-N Gordon 11 on both. And then Facebook, which, you know, really actually love to interact with people on Facebook mm -hmm. as well. Sort of Facebook almost seems to get forgotten these days, right. but, but a lot of people are on there. But you can just find me on Facebook, John Gordon. It's like John Gordon page, mm -hmm. J O N Gordon page. You can find me on there as well. Guys, if you get a chance, it's a must. Go check him out. Check out his website, buy the books, follow him on socials. You do a great job posting. Thanks for being on the show today. It was a pleasure having you on here. Thanks, Q. I got one more shot. I'm going to make it. One more chance. I'm going to take it. A minute when I said it, now it's time for me to do it. I got one life to live, so I put all into it, yeah.